So welcome everyone and thank you for joining Parks Disease Task Team webinar on pesky pentastomes, parasitic crustaceans coming to a state near you. My name is Carrie Wickstead and I work with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And with that role, I'm also the state agency's coordinator for PARC, which is the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. If you're not familiar with PARC, PARC is a large unaffiliated network um, that works on forging proactive partnerships to support amphibian reptile conservation and conservation of the habitats that they live within. And part of PARC is we have several national task teams that work on amphibian and reptile issues across the states. And today's um, feature is from PARC's National Disease Task Team, and they are all about facilitating and guiding communication and collaboration on herpetofaunal diseases among the PARC regions federal state agencies and their partners. And one of our current co-chairs of the National Disease Task Team, Jenna Palmisano, is one of our speakers today. We also have Lisa Schender. Um, she is the other co-lead for the Park Disease Task Team. And she's going to be helping me monitor the chat for questions that come up along the way. We'll have two sessions that will be available for questions and answer during this um, webinar. <clears throat> So before I uh, start and introduce our speakers today, a little bit of virtual housekeeping. Um, you might see the closed captioning that's available by clicking the little CC button at the bottom of your screen. And this webinar is currently being recorded for later posting on the Park Disease Task Team webpage. We'll also send out a link to all attendees once it's available. At this time, everyone is going to be muted until the Q&A sessions and you'll have a chance to either unmute yourself and ask your question or ask your question in the chat. So on behalf of PARC, we'd like to thank uh, PARC's disease task team for helping to develop the variety of products that have been mentioned in this talk, as well as disease specific fact sheets. We have one just recently updated on snake lungworm, which you uh, can access on our PARC disease task team page. And now I'm really pleased to introduce the speakers for today's webinar, Jenna Palmisano of Parks Disease Task Team and Dr. Terry Farrell. Jenna is a PhD student in Dr. Anna Savage's lab at the University of Central Florida. And Jenna began her studies with snake pentastomes during her undergraduate career at Stetson University. Here she conducted experimental infections of the intermediate host of the invasive pentastome to better understand which snakes were at risk of infection. At Stetson, she also started her studies of rattlesnakes, and now Jenna's dissertation focuses on host pathogen dynamics of pygmy rattlesnakes in Florida, including disease prevalence and severity, as well as adaptive immunity. On top of her work as a PhD student, Jenna is the co-chair of the Park Disease Task Team and the co-founder of a monitoring project known as SLAM, or the Snake Lungworm Alliance and Monitoring which you'll get to learn about a little bit more later in this presentation. With her today, we also have Dr. Terry Farrell, who received a bachelor's degree in biology from Bucknell University and then went to graduate school at Oregon State University and obtained a PhD in zoology there. Terry is faculty member at Stetson University in DeLand, Florida, and for three decades, he has studied the field biology of reptiles, particularly pygmy rattlesnakes, with a variety of collaborators and a large number of dedicated Stetson students. In recent years, much of his research has focused on the impacts of aphidiomycosis, aka snake fungal disease, and pentastome parasites on snake health. You all are in for a real treat, treat today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jenna and Terry to present. Thank you. Carrie, thank you so much. So like she said, like Carrie said, today we're going to be uh, talking about snake penisomes in North America with a particular focus on the invasive species that is causing problems in our native snake populations. So this species is pictured here moving and being pulled out of two rattlesnake species. So on the top left, we have our pygmy rattlesnakes that we've been talking about. And on the top right, we have an eastern diamondback rattlesnake. So we are invested in researching the invasive parasites, um, the invasive penicillin parasite and its impact on native snakes for several reasons. First, there is evidence um, for clinical signs of disease and mortality re related to infection. And second, the parasite utilizes many hosts, both in its immature and adult forms. And third, there's no known limitation to its spread in North America. 
So before we get started, I just wanna clarify some terms and definitions and make sure that we're all on the same page because we're gonna use these terms throughout. So pathogens are disease causing organisms and these can be parasites like nematodes, fungi like the pathogen that causes snake fungal disease and protists like Purkinsia that infects amphibians. Parasites rely on their hosts for sustenance but not all of them are going to cause disease. And it's hard to know clear details of infections and associated um, disease without performing experimental infections. From what we do understand, the invasive pentastome parasite that we will talk about today does cause disease, and this is known as pentastomiasis. We'll talk further about the clinical signs of the disease later on. But before we get there, we just got to talk about a few more terms related to the complex life cycles of parasites. So these are the terms we use to define different types of hosts in the complex life cycles. Uh, the definitive host is the host where the parasite develops into a mature form and reproduces. Um, this example on the right is a life cycle of a trematode. And we can see that after ingestion of an infected prey item, the definitive host, the heron, becomes infected. And soon the trematodes uh, develop into adults and produce eggs. Those eggs are then released in the feces, which are then ingested by the first intermediate host. The intermediate host, um, the eggs develop into an infectious larval form to then infect a second intermediate host. And a peritonic host is different than an intermediate host because it allows the immature or larval forms to persist but not develop. And all of these types of hosts play a role in snake penistome life cycles. So our focus today is obviously the snake penosomes, and they do have complex life cycles relying on at least one intermediate host. Our focal species or the invasive species uh, seems to exhibit a three host life cycle like we see here with the trematode. So just a quick overview of our topics for today. We're gonna cover a brief backgrounds of pentasomes and the native and invasive snake pentasome species here in North America. And we'll pause for a Q and A prior to getting into conservation concerns and future research. Um, and then we'll close with a second Q and A. So pictured here is a Southern black racer from Florida with multiple invasive penistomes crawling out of its mouth. And I would just like to note that gloves are an important part of reducing the transmission of pathogen, um, pathogens. And this snake was outside of my driveway in Orlando, Florida. So I acted rather quickly. So despite my poor biosecurity practice or lack thereof, um, it is important to wear gloves to reduce transmission between animals and when dealing with pathogens that we don't understand the zoonotic potential of. So to inhibit transmission to yourself. And we'll get into zoonosis in a moment. So with penosomes, there are a few species known to infect humans, but the concern of zoonosis or human infection from infected wildlife with the invasive penosome is currently unknown, but it's important to uh, be safe. So we've been chatting about these penosomes. So what exactly are penosomes? They are endoparasitic crustaceans. So they reside in the upper respiratory tracts of carnivorous reptiles. Uh, mostly, besides a couple that infect mammals and um, birds, if you don't consider birds reptiles. And just to remind everyone, just where crustaceans lie in the tree of life, crustacea is a subphylum of arthropods, and the phylum of arthropods is usually characterized by chitinous exoskeletons, segmented bodies, and paired jointed appendages, all of which pentastomes have. So as obligate parasites, these penistomes or penistomes at large are hematophagous in the respiratory systems. So they're feeding on the blood. So on the right here, you can see a mix of penistome adults from nine different genera to get an idea of the morphological diversity that uh, penistomes exhibit. Interestingly, penistomes are the oldest parasite known to science, uh, which is really cool, with fossil records dating to the late Cambrian period. So that's about 150 million years prior to their terrestrial vertebrate host arrival. So at some point in their evolution, they were um, free living. So these parasites have really been misunderstood as they have a mixture of shared characteristics between arthropods and annelids. Um, they even have a misnomer, so they're called pentastomes, which means five mouths, but they actually only have one feeding apparatus, which you can see in the anterior portion of the heads here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but I'm circling around it. And that's really their only uh, feeding apparatus. And the other four mistaken mouths are actually hooked like appendages. 
um, much of their taxonomy in the past has been confusing uh, with strictly morphological and developmental characters studied prior to current molecular tools that we now have. Um, but with those tools, we now understand them as a class of crustaceans. So um, this class of crustaceans is most closely related to maxillopods, which includes branchiera, which are fish lice, pictured here on the bottom left, and remipeds, which are tiny, free-living um, venomous crustaceans. So if you're interested in further details about the evolution and the phylogeny of penistomes, visit the wakelet that Kerry will share in the chat. It has a bunch of resources. Um, but currently myself, Dr. Terry Farrell and Dr. Robert Fitak at UCF are creating genomic resources to hopefully clarify their evolution. They kind of occupy like a major knowledge gap in crustacean phylogeny. So beyond the invasive snake penistome that we'll be focusing on today and the conservation concerns that comes with it, they are really this anomaly and a really interesting group that we need to learn um, and know more about. And the mitochondrial genome um, of the invasive species is in review currently. So hopefully we'll have that out for you shortly. So all penistomes are gonna progress through these three life stages we see here. And there are many different types of penistome species. There are some that infect gators, alligators, some that infect turtles, some birds, some mammals, and many infect snakes. In all stages, they have the four hook-like appendages that we talked about. And on the left, you can see the first stage, which is the embryonated egg, which is released into the environment from the definitive host. In the middle is the larval form, which resembles kind of a tardigrade a little bit. And on the right is the adult form. And this adult drawing is actually one of the three genera that are known to infect humans. So we're gonna talk a little bit about zoonotic concerns before we jump into North American pentasomes. So we don't know the full extent of zoonotic concerns for all penisome species beyond these three genera listed here. So armillifer, porocephalus, and lingutula. Zoonosis, again, is a disease that can be transmitted from animals to humans, and the highest prevalence of human infections with penisomes have been found in Africa, the Middle East, and South and Central America. There is a uh, recent publication in a country, Indonesia, that farms snakes for food that warn about the potential dangers of um, eating undercooked snake meat because the snakes in that slaughterhouse had over 60% prevalence of pentisomes. There hasn't really been much on the zoonotic concerns of penistome infections from handling captive and wild snakes. However, if hands are not washed um, after handling infected snakes or their substrate, there is a potential for ingestion of eggs and therefore larval infection in humans. Um, we don't know much about the real ITLids that we'll focus on today though. And there are two publications related to human infections in the way clip that you can uh, check out. So jumping into North American pentastomes, there are two abundant snake pentastomes that are native to North America. One is Curacephalus coarctatus, which is on the left with a very bulbous head that makes it distinct um, from the other parasite that's native. And that one is Porocephalus crotali, which is on the right. Uh, both of these species get quite large and they live in the anterior highly vascular part of the snake lung and each species has hooks aligned in somewhat of a row and in similar sizes, which is distinct from the invasive species that we'll talk about. So poor crotali uses mammals mostly as intermediate homes in location of 27% of North American pit vipers with porocephalus crotali infections. And on the right, you can see the life cycle of P. crotali and the succession of its molts within the host. And we know so much about this life cycle because in the 1960s, there were some experimental infections with cottonmouths and rodents. Um, from what we know, Curacephalus coarctatus uses fish as intermediate hosts, but it might use other intermediate hosts as well. Um, and we see a highest prevalence in natrocines or water snakes. So though penistome infections are diet dependent based on the intermediate hosts, there are always exceptions to those being infected, especially with snakes that have a more general diet and eat a variety of hosts. Terry, do you have anything to add? No, it's uh, great that we're covering those native species though, because as we'll talk about, 
the real concern is this invasive species and a key step is making sure you can distinguish between the two and it can be done both morphologically and through DNA sequencing and Jenna will hit, hit that in greater detail. Yep, awesome. So just like Terry said, um, there's not really any clear conservation implications with these native penistomes. Uh, surveillance has been opportunistic and so our prevalence data is quite limited. Um, and here we can see pictures of P. crotoli taken out of a cotton mouth on the left. Um, the spirals in the middle are actually the ovaries. And on the right is a Curacephalus coarctatus in, or multiple Curacephalus coarctatus in an eastern indigo snake. So these native penistomes do get quite large. Um, and from prevalence data, current prevalence data, Curacephalus seems to have less intense infections, often only having one to five adults within the snake host. But porocephalus can be quite severe with over 10 individuals in the host. And we've posted a dissection video on the wakelet where we're pulling uh, both the native species and the invasive species out of North American snakes. So that can give you another um, look at how different they are morphologically. And one thing to note is we might not know much about these native penistomes because they might not be causing a problem, just like Terry noted. So penistomes have evolved to evade the immune system of their hosts, and they do a good job at it. So um, it might be the case that the native penistomes are not causing a problem, and we haven't seen much mortality associated it, with it. Um, but we just don't know much about the sublethal impacts of these native penistomes. And we know even less about the invasive snake penistomes, um, as well as another uh, penistome that infects lizards, which we'll get to. So there's one that utilizes snakes as definitive hosts, which is our focus, Relitella orientalis, and one that infects lizards as definitive hosts. So that's Relitella frenatus. And sometimes in the literature, it's referred to as indica, but we've um, found that those are actually synonymous, not we, Dr. Uh, Crystal Kelly here has. So both of these species, both of these Relitellids have invaded Australia in addition to North America. So in Australia, most of our current knowledge comes from Dr. Crystal Kelly here, who I mentioned, and she's done work on both parasites. So Fernatus has spread continent-wide with the cane toads. And in North America, much of our current knowledge of RO comes from Dr. Melissa Miller's work. Um, but we unfortunately have very limited data on Relitella Fernatus in North America. So I just briefly wanted to discuss the potential conservation concerns of Relitella frenatus and the likelihood of it, it spreading widely throughout the Southern United States, as it uses many invasive species that have been documented um, or has been, <laughs> uses many invasive species as hosts. So including the Mediterranean gecko, which is pictured here with its known range in the US. Again, Relitella frenatus pictured in the bottom left here infects lizards as definitive hosts, not snakes. Um, uh, there have been infected Mediterranean geckos found in Texas and infected native green anoles found in Louisiana. We also know that brown anoles are competent hosts and have, have been found with infections in Hawaii, along with cane toads and three invasive geckos pictured here. So this pathogen could impact native lizard species, but there's just little data on prevalence and physiological impacts. So there's one publication from Texas A&M that indicates that severe infections with Frenatus causes strong physiological effects on geckos that have recently been active. So they speculate that that's due to the mechanical constraints, just having large parasites within their lungs. So Terry, do you have anything to add on Frenatus before we move to Oriental. No, it, it's certainly a species we need more work on. It's just recently been, been found in Florida in uh, chameleons, I believe, and introduced chameleons. And I suspect it's just much more widespread than any of us realize that these, several of these Raleotialid pentastomes seem to be really good at invading. And uh, it would be interesting to know more about Frenatus. Absolutely. Okay, so for the rest of the webinar, we're going to focus on the Relitellid that infects snakes. So I will refer to Relitella orientalis as RO or snake lungworm moving forward. Uh, and this species has a native range in Asia and is suspected to have spilt into native snake populations um, from Burmese python populations in South Florida. 
So on the right is a picture by our colleague Corinna Hazelrig of a deceased pygmy rattlesnake with an adult lungworm hanging out of its mouth. And on the left is an adult female. So though it is likely that Burmese pythons were the initial culprit of spread, the lungworm's use of diverse and abundant intermediate hosts is likely what has increased the spread both geographically and taxonomically in North America. So our experimental infection studies, which the title was just right there, um, have demonstrated that anurans and lizards are prominent intermediate hosts. And this corresponds with the diets um, of the snakes that are most often infected. There are, however, snakes that are infected who mostly feed on animal, uh, mammals like eastern diamondback rattlesnakes. And currently, unfortunately, the only record of a real itiella from a mammalian intermediate host um, was a Kenyan shrew. So mammals play a role in this life cycle. We just are unsure of what it is exactly. So our experimental infection studies support that this lungworm likely exhibits a three host uh, cycle, starting with an invertebrate. And the lungworm's eggs are passed with the feces of the snake, which are then ingested by a coprophagous invertebrate, so one that eats feces like a beetle or a cockroach. And on the top right here, you can see pictures of RO eggs from a snake's fecal sample. And the infection studies are on the wakelet as well, so you can check those out. So this is what larvae removed from the fat bodies of the infected roaches look like. So that's where they migrate and insist. They're quite small at this stage, about 0.2 millimeters, and they're not visible to the naked eye, um, but they do still, however, sport those four hook-like appendages that we've been talking about. So when a lizard or a frog consume an infected cockroach, they became infected with larvae about double in size. And here you can see those larger larvae through the body wall of an experimentally exposed brown anole. From the experimental infection studies, again, and you can find those on the wakelet, uh, we did not find impacts of RO infection on the growth rate or survival of the intermediate hosts. And though this makes sense given the size of the larvae and the relative inactivity, more research is definitely needed to confirm this and whether or not RO is a concern for intermediate hosts as well, a conservation concern. So when snakes ingest an infected lizard or frog, the lungworm larvae bore through the gut and migrate to the lungs where they insist in molt until reproductively mature, usually after a couple of months. The adults can be over 100 millimeters long, so they get quite large. And we're going to see some, some pretty gross pictures coming up, so I'm warning you. Uh, so here are two, here are three different individual infections. The two on the left are banded water snakes from Southwest Florida. Our collaborators at Florida Gulf Coast University collected these, uh, Dr. Andrew Durso specifically. And on the right is a black racer infection. You can see that a lot of these individuals are quite large. Um, they get bigger in native hosts. So the pentasomes get bigger in native hosts than they do in Burmese pythons. And we also see in native hosts that the, the infections are more female dominant. So a lot of the larger ones we're looking at here are, are females. So currently we know of 17 native snake species that serve as definitive hosts for snake lungworm. And often infections are much more severe in native snake hosts compared to the Burmese pythons with over hundred individuals feeding on the snake's blood in the lung in some cases. We know that toke geckos and tegu lizards can also host adults as well. And there's some evidence that iguanas might too. The abundance of native and invasive definitive host continued geographic spread. So in addition to wild animals spreading the disease, captive animals can as well. For instance, many tegus are held in outdoor enclosure, enclosures and snakes are too, um, and that could contribute to the spread. So if those animals are held outside and they're infected, they pass eggs with their feces, a cockroach or a beetle moves in and out of the enclosure and therefore spreads the disease into the wild. So here are the documented snakes in Florida with infections. The ones in red are more recently found and not published just yet. And note that the federally protected Eastern indigo snake has been found with infections. And there's further evidence. Um, Dr. James Bogan, who I believe is on the call, is doing a lot of work looking at the prevalence in indigo snakes in Florida. Um, and I think we're seeing quite a bit of infections in the indigo snakes. So definitely a cause of concern. 
Here are the current known intermediate hosts in addition to the Tegus who can serve as an intermediate host and a definitive host. So Madison Harmon, who is a graduate student at the University of Florida has done a lot of research on penistomes and Tegus and found that they can support larval growth um, as well as reproductive adults. And on the wakelet, there's a link to her research gate and she's done a lot of presentations on her research. So go check that out if you're interested in how penistomes and other parasites um, are infecting tegus. So time for a break and to hear your questions, um, hopefully answer them. And we'll cover the known geographic range of RO and the likely conservation concerns after this Q&A. Wonderful. We haven't had any questions in the chat. Uh, everybody's been listening with rapt attention to your presentation so far, really interesting and, and slightly scary. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or you can also raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute yourself to ask your question. Great, we have our first one from Alex Wolf. What's, the known, what's known about the range of these parasites? How forth, far north do they extend? We're gonna talk about that. I'm not gonna tell you just yet, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta wait. And then Natalie Stillwell asks, are there any known antemortem symptoms with pentasomiasis? You know, one of the things sometimes you see is snakes that seem to have trouble breathing. They have some respiratory issues. Sometimes snakes will uh, pop up pentastomes. Um, you know, perhaps it's a penistome that died and they retch them up, um, though some penistomes are so large they cannot get through the trachea, which is a, a real problem in terms of treating snakes with pentastomiasis. Um, there is no easy way to discern from outward appearance if snakes have penistomes. Um, it, it, what you can do in, in terms of diagnosis is do fecal samples, and we'll talk a little more about that. I should also point out that a heavy case of penistomiasis in a variety of snakes seems to lead to weight loss in individuals that are just emaciated. And often we'll talk a little about comorbidities later on, um, a variety of other inflictions that they suffer when uh, they start to have real serious issues with penistomes. Thank you. And Terry, you sort of touched on this next question is, the only quick way to diagnose um, either presence in the oral cavity or dissection. It sounds like fecal um, samples were one way to non-lethally diagnose, right? Yeah, so fecal samples um, are, you can, and we're working on improving techniques with that with uh, Dr. Bogan, but you can look at fecal samples and even just do uh, wet mounts. You don't have to necessarily even do fecal flotation, though that may be advisable. Um, dissection definitely uh, is the, you know, a nice way to do it for roadkill specimens. Of course, with live snakes, you don't want to do that. Um, and right now, um, we've got some promising initial results. Jenna's been looking at um, swabs, uh, anal swabs, and running uh, PCR DNA sequencing to determine if snakes are positive that way. And we hope to uh, document how that works because for researchers, it's often much easier to grab a snake, take a quick swab and not wait till a fecal sample is produced. Um, for pet owners, getting a fecal sample isn't typically a big problem. Thank you. And there's another question. How do you distinguish between native and invasive pentastomes? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, morphologically, they're quite distinct. And if you check out our dissection video on the wakelet, you'll see that. Um, I feel like the invasive penistome is a lot thinner and like more gooey where the native penistomes are have a much thicker cuticle and large heads where the invasive one, which you can see on the screen here, kind of has a flattened and triangular head and all of those hooks are not in a row and the posterior hooks are also much larger. Uh, of course, um, with morphological 
identification, you should always double check um, molecularly if you're unsure. And ye, a lot of us have been using just the 18S um, as a diagnosis with conventional PCR. So molecular and morphologically, uh, morphological is, is the best way. Thank you. And Ian Biazzo would like to know, do you think differential immune response contributes to different pentastome sizes in native snakes, i.e. versus Burmese pythons, et cetera? Yeah, it totally, we don't know. I mean, that's, if I say yes, it would be totally speculative, but it's something that I'm interested in looking at of, you know, why different species compared to Burmese pythons um, are experiencing fatal infections or more extreme infections. And we also don't know why a lot of the native snakes are having female dominant infections and the females are the ones that live longer and get much larger. So unknown, but great question. It's one of my, um, one of my dissertation questions as well. Excellent. And that kind of hits on a question that Brian just um, asked about pentastome sex ratios being variable among hosts with more females observed. How, and he wanted to know if he heard that right. And if so, how is sex determined in pentastomes? Is it chromosomal or something else? So you can, you can see, um, you can see either ovaries or copulatory spicules and the males are usually much smaller just by looking at them. Um, you can typically tell and decipher which ones are males and which ones are females, but as soon as you put them under the scope, you're either gonna see ovaries with a bunch of eggs or you're gonna see copulatory spicules. It's a new term for me, copulatory spicules. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I'm, not, I'm actually not sure about uh the mechanism of sex determination. I think it is um, gonochoristic. I think it is genetically determined, um, but um, I don't want to <laughs> stake a claim on that because I'm not absolutely certain. But it is, I think the, what tends to happen is the males are shorter lived, they inseminate the females, and then they disappear from the system. And so often you see a bunch of big fecund females and perhaps no males in a host, um, and that's not at all unusual. They store sperm. Okay, thank you. All right, last question before we move on to the rest. Um, Allery Hayes would like to know, how certain are we in the life cycle of RO since they seem to be generalists in mature infections? Yeah, I would say we're not certain. We've supported that the route of invertebrate to um, a neuron, so frogs and toads, as well as um, invertebrate to lizards is, we know that is for sure because it works in the lab and we've seen both of those um, groups of animals infected in the wild, but yeah, their life cycle is quite convoluted and complex. And just like you noted, they are generalists. So there's possibility that they're doing things that we can't really or don't really understand at this moment. I would like to note that at the beginning in our experimental infections, we did feed, not to make things more confusing, but we did feed lizards eggs. So instead of just feeding them cockroaches that we fed eggs, we fed the lizards eggs directly and they were able to get infected. But when we fed eggs directly to frogs and toads, they were not infected. And we don't know the mechanism that um, allows for that at all. So we don't know why the eggs decide to hatch in certain hosts. Um, and we don't know what initiates them hatching. And we also don't know what initiates um, the larval movements in first and second intermediate host. Great question though. So no, we're not sure on this. All right, thank you. Lots of opportunities for research, right? Yes. All right, well, I will let you continue on with some of the conservation concerns and where it's at right now. Thank you. Awesome. So we've got 17 snake species in North America that we know have infections. So now we're gonna talk where it is. I know you've been waiting. So Dr. Melissa Miller was the first one to report the invasive lungworm in Florida, and she did that prior to 2017. All of her records are in gray on this map. Um, and it is important to note that all of the resources where these um, are on the wakelet, so these come from multiple publications. They come from Dr. Bogan's publication, um, Dr. Heather Walden's publication, uh, Terry's publication, as well as our most recent publication, and uh, Matthew, Matthew Metcalf. So lots of people have been involved in this and um, all of the resources and papers that um, 
recognize that are in the wakelet. So the legend corresponds to the years of collection, not the years of publication. And again, yeah, they can all be found on the wakelet. So as surveillance has increased, we find the range of the lungworm is much farther north than established python populations. So this expansion, again, supports the likelihood of intermediate hosts influencing that spread. So why is this increase in spread a major concern, especially in the Southeast? Well, RO is invading a biological hotspot of squamates in North America, and there are many snakes at risk of infection. And as of right now, we don't know, or there are no limits to which species can be infected. Um, and we don't know which species might be more or less tolerant of the disease. Further, there are no limitations to how far RO can spread, especially as it utilizes widespread synanthropic intermediate hosts. And synanthropic hosts just means they're closely related to human activities and they often hitchhike with us on our vehicles or in the plant trade um, and in other ways. So when they move, they bring their parasites along. Um, further, a lot of Florida snakes can, are often wild caught and sold nationally, so that can be another route of transmission. One lizard that we all know is exceptional at catching rinds with humans is the brown anole, which serves as a competent intermediate host and is also pervasive throughout the Florida panhandle, uh, the peninsula, Texas, as well as the coast of Georgia and South Carolina. So back to why we care so much about those parasites spreading further and getting into more native snake species. So there's evidence that for some species, the snake lung worm introduction is aligned with population declines, both temporally and spatially. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. But like Terry was noting, we see variable lethality associated with infections between and within species. So with black racers, um, the one that was pictured on the second, like the overview slide, um, that one had ideal body condition. We don't, it was probably just knit by a car and that's why it died, but it had 60 plus adults in the lungs. And when I say ideal body condition, it had plenty of fat reserves. It had little lesions in the lungs and it was yoking up follicles. So it died for another reason, not from the 60 plus adult penistomes that were in its lungs. Whereas some of our collaborators see snakes acting weird, moving lethargically, and then they find them dead the next day, and the infection intensity is nowhere near that severe. So they'll have like five to 10 adults in the lungs, and there's no other reason for them um, to have died. So there's a large um, variation in the responses of snakes to these infections. And in captive snakes with infections, there have been symptoms such as decreased breath rate, substantial anemia, lethargy, and reluctance reluctancy to eat reported. Um, some sublethal impacts that have been reported in wild snakes include emaciation, lesions of the lungs. You can see the hooks and how big and sharp they are in the bottom left there, um, as well as pneumonia, anemia, and sepsis. Whenever we say sublethal though, it's still important to note that they are energetically costly impacts on the snakes. And when snakes are dealing with multiple infections, we don't really understand how co-infections with diseases um, like snake fungal disease are going to impact survival, growth rate, or reproductive output. So a lot of the studies that Terry has been a part of with researchers from New Jersey, um, Dr. Joey Gugliaro and Dr. Craig Lind, they've reported that snake fungal disease alone disrupts normal reproduction and therefore could cause population declines. They've also reported um, the metabolic costs of this disease. So when, when animals are already dealing with snake fungal disease and other diseases, we don't know how the introduction of pentastomes is going to impact them. Terry, do you have anything you want to add there? Yeah, I, it's a very interesting situation trying to figure out cause of death in a snake and also causes of population declines. But, you know, in one well-studied population of pygmy rattlesnakes, we had for several decades common minor uh, snake fungal disease, ophiomycosis lesions, um, and it's been well documented. We understand prevalence there. And the snake populations were doing fine until RO showed up, and then we had a precipitous decline in the population. It has just crashed. And another population nearby, which has incredibly low prevalence of RO, 
this does have SFD, but that population is doing fine. So I suspect RO is a big problem and uh, is something that actually has me far more alarmed for Florida snakes than ophidiomycosis. Awesome, thank you. All right, so the snakes at the highest risk of infection are those that rely on amphibians and lizards as prey items. This is supported by the current prevalence data in the US and in Australia as well as the infection studies that confirm frogs and lizards as competent hosts. So the southern hognose, which is a state protected species in Florida, relies on an amphibian prey base. It has not been documented with infections just yet, but it's important that we survey the southern hognoses for infection as they've already experienced dramatic declines in Florida. So all of our native snake species are immunologically naive hosts, which may exacerbate the disease. There are, however, some native species like pygmies, pygmy rattlesnakes, that lack any history with penistomes, and we don't know if this further naivete plays a role in tolerating the disease. So how do we detect infection? With intermediate hosts, unfortunately, we only know how to detect infection um, through dissections, so a lot of prevalence data will likely continue to be opportunistic. Um, for live definitive hosts, we can assess infection through fecal um, sample screening. So these female penisomes produce hundreds of thousands of eggs. So usually if you get an animal that's infected, um, you like Terry was saying, you can either do a fecal float um, or you can just make a wet mount and um, with a small amount of feces and see a bunch of eggs. And also, as Terry mentioned, uh, we are currently developing a swab protocol to detect infection regardless of feces because some snakes don't want to be so generous to give us some. So, and then for roadkill snakes, we can dissect them to check for infections in the lungs as well. Um, Terry and I started a widespread monitoring program that Kerry mentioned in the beginning called SLAM. Um, in my PI, Dr. Anna Savage gave us that name, so thank you. And that stands for Snake Lungworm Alliance and Monitoring. And this group is, has about 50 collaborators involved from government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and universities across six states of the southeastern U.S. And in the first year, we found a new host species the mud snake and six new county records, four of which were published in the paper here, which will be on the wakelet. So the most important research needed right now beyond a better understanding of who penistomes are in an evolutionary sense and the mechanisms of disease is surveillance in the pet trade and throughout the southeastern US. So Terry and I have found four captive infections so far, just opportunistically, three of which resulted in mortality just within months, a couple of months of being sold. And two of those that resulted in mortality, you can see here. So these are two garter snakes from a, the same breeder in Miami, but based on their um, physical appearance, like stubby tails, we do believe they were wild caught specimens. And also through social media, you can see the title of Terry's most recent paper at the bottom here. Um, Terry found a captive infection in Michigan. So that was one, that was a banded water snake that spit out a pentasome. Um, and a woman posted it on Facebook and Terry found it. So these accidental findings indicate that a lot, a lot more attention and resources are needed for penasome research in the pet trade and, and beyond. Terry, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think one thing we might want to think about is the degree to which captive and wild animals are not well separated, you know, in and that's, I think, particularly true in the southeast where people may take snake uh, bedding material and compost it, which is releasing eggs into the environment in places that have loads of roaches, which are known intermediate hosts. Um, other people buy Brown and Oles from Florida, again, known competent intermediate hosts as feeder uh, material for their snakes. And so we are shipping out from Florida tens of thousands, quite likely, of anoles a year, many of which are designated to be fed to snakes. And so there's a lot of avenues by which snakes and pentastomes can move around in the environment, and we should be careful not to think this is just an issue for wild snakes and that wild 
snakes and reptiles and amphibians are totally separate from captive populations. There's a surprising amount of interconnections. Thank you. All right. Jack, I see that your hand is raised. We're almost at the last Q&A and then we'll be able to answer your question. All right, so we're talking about a bunch of research that needs to be done, but there are a handful of great researchers working with this parasite. Um, so I wanted to note them. Um, so SLAM is monitoring the spread across the Southeast. Uh, James Bogan is doing a lot of work with indigo snakes and he is with, Dr. Bogan is with the uh, Central Florida Zoo as well as the OCIC, so the Orient Center for Indigo Conservation. At UCF, the University of Central Florida, uh, myself and Dr. Robert Fitak and a few other researchers are working on the reconstruction of penistomid uh, phylogeny. Uh, Dr. Robert Ozaboff, as well as us at UF, UCF are working on new diagnostic tools. Um, there's work with prevalence um, in tegus being done, again, by Madison Harmon. You can check out her research gate through the wakelet. Uh, there's collaborators at Florida Gulf Coast University. Their campus prevalence of RO is extreme. So they have um, an opportunity to look more into the intermediate hosts and they're finding new host species there. And they're also, Dr. Christina Anaya and Dr. Andrew Durso are looking into um, understanding the life cycle a little bit more as well. So there are a lot of people doing great work. Uh, we just need more resources and more funding uh, towards these types of projects. And with SLAM, I would just like to call out that we have, like I said, about 50 collaborators. So um, thank you all for whoever's on the call and whoever watches this later, just thank you for continuing to collect samples for us, um, especially the Orient Society. Uh, thank you, Ben Steganga, who's collected a bunch of samples for us, as well as Michael Brennan with uh, Georgia Southern and Jekyll Island, uh, Dane Conley at Virginia Tech and Corinna with UGA, all have been um, instrumental in this um, monitoring program. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and definitely, uh, hopefully more people will join this effort in terms of basically collecting material and we can explain what we need in detail through email or if you contact us in any way. Um, but yeah, we're, we want to build this network, this surveillance network, because we don't expect a simple wave-like expansion of this parasite, given the intermediate hosts which are infected, it's probably going to leap great distances as humans transport it, and it's going to require a broad survey network to detect that and to be able to react to it. Yes, and we are making an ARC story map um, currently so that all of our data can be publicly available as we get it. Um, but I just, I love this network. It's really cool. It's a great example of how collaborative science is the best science. So yes, contact us if you want to get involved. Um, one thing I wanted to note was a little bit about my dissertation research with our Orientalis. So Terry's been talking about pygmy rattlesnakes exhibiting declines aligned with the arrival of R. orientalis, both temporally and spatially. So for my dissertation, I'll be studying the host pathogen dynamics of RO and pygmies to understand the drivers and impacts of disease um, and co-infections with snake fungal disease. So pygmies, again, are completely naive hosts. And just in the past year, Corinna, Terry, and I have found eight dead pygmy rattlesnakes between two of our mark recapture sites, and six of those had infections. So what you can do is uh, to help is contact us if you find dead or sick snakes. You can contact us through the Herp Delete Disease Alert System, which there is a QR code at the bottom right of the screen. Um, and if you find a dead snake with the lungworm moving out of its mouth, that's one thing we didn't mention is that often when the host dies, the parasites have the propensity to move out of the lungs and out of the trachea and into the mouth. So if you find a dead snake with this um, lungworm crawling out, please take pictures of the entire lungworm and get close-ups of either end if you're unsure which is the head because it will help us be able to morphologically distinguish if it's the invasive versus the native. Um, and as we mentioned, there are unknown zoonotic concerns with this disease. So if you're handling captive or wild snakes that you don't know are infected, wash your hands and wear gloves if you have them. Um, from what we know so far, both ethanol and bleach kill the parasites. So if you treat the substrate of um, 
substrate waste of your pet with either, you'll reduce the spread and the potential for zoonosis, especially if you're composting. Um, and the other QR, QR code is to the park biosecurity webinar, which is a more general biosecurity. It's based on amphibians, but a lot of it can be applied to penistomes as well. Yeah, thank you so much for sticking with us. It looked like we retained most of you. Uh, please stay on if you have more questions. And here's a QR code for the updated park fact sheet on the lungworm um, and our contact for the disease task team. And on the fact sheet is uh, my school email as well. So you can contact me there too. And I would just like to note that my name is all over the fact sheet, but the original people that wrote that fact sheet were Dee Olson and Dr. Robert Ozaboff. So um, some of their general structure and wording are still there. So I'd like to just give them credit. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna and Terry. That was fantastic. And as you might imagine, we have some questions that are rolling in in the chat and a few comments. Um, Tom Jones from Arizona just wanted to note that Anola sagrii is now known in Arizona as of uh, 2022 paper, so they're spreading. <laughs> um, Shane Boylan wants to know, have you tried radiographs, bronchoscopy in uh, US and CT for those infected animals with appropriate sizes? You know, we're not veterinarians, and so I, I have collaborated with um, folks at UF, particularly Heather Wald and Robert Osboff and Jim Wellahan. And um, one of the things that's quite informative is endoscopes. Um, that that with bigger snakes, you can run it down the trachea. With pygmy rattlesnakes, it was necessary to make a lateral incision. Um, but again, it's invasive. It's a uh, trickier and we haven't tried um, some of those other techniques. Unfortunately, these invasive penistomes are really only a millimeter or two wide um, and their exoskeleton is not very thick. I wonder how well they would show up in other kinds of imaging in inside the lung of a snake. I, you know, I th think in severe infections, you might be able to see the mass of spaghetti, but in less severe infections, I don't think uh, that would be an easy approach. But if uh, someone with more veterinarian expertise wants to contradict that, I'd be, you know, I'm, I'd be happy to hear about it. And Brad O'Hanlon would like to know, how long are eggs viable? That's a great question. I don't, Terry, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, we've done some studies where um, we took snake feces that were infected with snakes. Um, we use roaches as a bioassay because they are so easily infected when they consume the eggs, which they readily do. And um, we found over 16 days, uh, there was pretty much no impact 16 days post deposition of the feces. So after uh, you know the feces were produced and we held half the feces in 0% humidity because we actually thought that these parasites might not be all that tolerant of desiccation, but they can go several weeks at 0% humidity and still be viable. It's also a little worrisome. We've had roaches that we had infected for over a year. Roach longevity is quite surprising. So we basically gave these roaches a one-time exposure, waited a year, and then fed those roaches um, to lizards and the lizards became infected. So I think this helps explain why these parasites are spreading so much. Not only are the eggs pretty tough, but that first intermediate stage in the roaches remains viable for over a year after infection, giving the roach plenty of time to get eaten by a lizard or a frog. And similarly, it looks like within at least frogs and lizards, those insisted parasites live very long times, you know, so that the parasite can wait for a snake to consume it. Um, so they're, they're a pretty tough egg. We don't have a good answer on how long it takes to kill eggs uh, just laying around, um, but it's more than a couple of weeks, even under pretty extreme situations, though freezing does kill the egg. So we have frozen eggs, done infection experiment, 
experiments. And if you freeze these penistome eggs, they are not viable. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> um, Rox would like to know, are snakes treatable if RO is found? So we don't really know, uh, to be honest. There are a couple, there's, there's one note of two infected ball pythons, but in the paper, it's from Poland, and in the paper, they don't say which penistomes they were infected with, but Panicure seemed to work. Um, I don't know of other cases where it's worked, and this might be where if Dr. James Bogan is still with us and he has um, some insight on that, he'd be better to answer that. Again, Terry and I are not vets. So, um, but that's the only paper that I know of that talks about um, a cure actually working, but they don't note that it was Relitella orientalis in the ball python. So. Yeah, there is also a recent paper on uh, some Japanese uh, lizards in the pet trade, which were infected with another species of Raleatella. Um, so it's in the same genus as RO, um, and they effectively treated it there. Um, Thank you. Well, lots of folks have um, lots of great things to say about this webinar in the chat. If anybody has any questions they would like to ask out loud, or um, I know somebody, I think it was Jack, raised your hand. So if anybody has those questions, um, you have the ability to raise your hand and unmute yourself. And Shane, thank you. It looks like Shane shared a um, link in the chat about um, radio diagnostic methods for studying swim bladder inflammation. So we'll add that to the list of resources there. All right, well, if there are no further questions, um, thank you all who made this happen, um, especially to Dr. Terry Farrell and Jenna Palmisano for being our amazing speakers today. They're at the forefront of this parasite um, happening here in the United States. So we're extremely fortunate to have them um, here and speaking about this and getting the information out. So please keep your eyes out and consider reporting anything that you might find to things like our herp disease alert system or to your state fish and wildlife agency. If you enjoyed this presentation and you're interested in more, please check out the park um, website, which is parkplace.org, and check out our YouTube channel where we have some of the other disease task team webinars, as well as a few other webinars that have been hosted by PARC. And then also we plan to host more in the future. So you can sign up for our monthly newsletter to get information about activities and events and resources that are all happening. We're in the midst of Wild Turtle Week, if you're not familiar with that. And we just had a video from Jeff Corwin come out about turtles and why every turtle counts. So thank you again, and we'll hang in here for any final questions. I'll stop recording and you'll get this recording shortly um, next week.